Hi there. This is a story of one runestone cross and the subtle heathen meanings in this image here. An image which is perhaps the most important image in the history of my country, Denmark. It's the figure of Jesus on the yelling stone in Jutland. It's not so far from where I grew up. In fact, a high school friend of mine lived just around the corner from here. Uh, my name is uh, Rune Janne Rasmussen. I'm a historian of religion from the universities of Uppsala and Copenhagen. You can Patreon support my work with renewing our knowledge of Nordic history of religions with cutting edge anthropology if you want. Well, images have many meanings. And these meanings, they aren't simple. They're rich, they're ambiguous, and they can even be contradictory. In this video, I will talk a little bit about the obvious meanings of this crucifixion scene and uh, also a, a little bit about the less obvious heathen meanings that seem to almost contradict the Christian power language that this stone uh, represents. The, uh, the stone was set by King Harald the Bluetooth, who also built uh, fortresses around Denmark and can probably be credited with assembling Denmark as a state. Um, and part of this state-building project was making the inhabitants of this land march in line. And one very good way of doing that is to make sure that all the people's worship are aligned. And this is where Christianity came, came into the picture. Uh, on this stone, Harald claims to have subjugated all Denmark and Norway. And uh, under this image of Christ, he concludes his uh, Viking Age selfieing endeavor here by stating that he made the Danes Christian. Auk Tani Karthi Krishna, it says. Now, it's probably a universal tru truth that nobody ever asks to be made Christian, because if somebody wants to become a Christian, then they will go and become a Christian without anybody having to make them anything. Um, but this making people Christian, that's necessary if Christianity is to be applied for state formation and empire building like uh, Harold intended. Uh, in the preceding centuries, the Saxons and Frisians and Anglo-Saxons, they had been exposed to this making people Christians, at times in, in very violent ways. So there are actually historians who believe that, this, that there is a link between Harold's fortification of Denmark and this demonstrative making the Danes Christian. Um, other uh, European powers may have gotten the idea of making crusades against the heathens. And this was the thing in the Middle Ages. When, uh, when Danish kings uh, themselves uh, became aligned with Christianity, they certainly caught on to the idea and inflicted uh, a series of crusades on the uh, Baltic area. And, uh, and, and who knows, uh, perhaps this was also part of the wanting to make people Christians. I doubt that these medieval and Iron Age kings, uh, who were pretty, you know, uh, uh, violent bastards, that they would have liked this religion so much if it wasn't because uh, of its military potential in assembling states, making allies, and being able to attack people who weren't Christians. So, the statement uh, of this cross is certainly a case of religion made very political. People being made to comply with a specific standard for religion. The stone is sometimes called the birthplace of Denmark, uh, which may be why uh, this uh, image is, is uh, stamped on every single Danish passport, um, as almost as if Harold's making, the, making us Christians is supposed to be imprinted on uh, our very citizenship. And believe it or not, I think it's still a thing, this uh, making the Danes Christian. For instance, the previous um, uh, nationalist government, they put it as a, uh, an explicit statement uh, in their statement of purpose, the, uh, a declaration that Denmark is a Christian country. Uh, they even tried to make this, uh, write this Christianity into the statement of purpose, purpose of the tax-paid national television channel. Making the Danes Christian is obviously an ongoing political project, because of course the Danes weren't uh, Christian. Harold didn't make them Christian. You know, as late as in the 16th or 17th century, you could still find people praying to Thor. Um, animist religiosity continued to permeate people's life in multiple ways, and the church continued to struggle to oppress people's organic animist religiosity. In the Danish law of uh, 1683, it stated that perpetrators of blasphemy should be beheaded after having their tongue cut out. 
In 1693, a 74-year-old woman was decapitated and burned, uh, where one of the reasons was that she had a uh, house uh, patron spirit living in her farm. And I think it was uh, sometime in the 19th century that uh, non-Christians became able to uh, inherit. You were basically le legally disinherited if you um, weren't a Christian. In 1735, a witch hammer was published in Denmark uh, for the purpose of eradicating the leftovers of heathen and Catholic uh, uh, practices in the um, population. And still today, Christianity is, is practiced by the Danish state in some very medieval ways that basically aren't particularly worthy of a contemporary, inclusive, progressive, humanist state. Like, thanks for nothing, Harold. You know, a recent documentary series um, uh, from the, this national taxpayer, pay, uh, taxpayer paid <laughs> TV channel called, um, it was called A Millennia of Belief, and that was explicitly defined as the history of Christianity in Denmark. A millennia of Belief was just identified as Christianity. It wasn't the history of religions where Christianity, of course, plays a, a very important role, perhaps the most important element, but the history of Christianity. Pre-Christian beliefs were like treated as a backdrop for the, uh, kind of touched as a backdrop for the implementation of Christianity, really of zero relevance. Uh, and all the non-Christian and different animist beliefs that continue to exist are like almost silenced. Faith in Denmark uh, was uh, unilaterally identified with Christianity in this recent documentary. Um, Another example of this uh, ongoing practice of Harold's uh, Christianizing proje project is the way that Christianity is written into the Danish constitution. The monarch, um, Harold's descendant actually, is, is required by law to be a member of the national church. And this is not just like an irrelevant relic. Uh, when the, the present crown prince, who will one day become a king, at some point, point, he spoke out in a fairly normal, secular way about religion. And then the clerical establishment, they came down on him as if it had been Saudi Arabia or something. And, but in, in spite of this ongoing pressure to make the Danes Christian, the effort is still, I would say, fairly unsuccessful. The Danes aren't particularly Christian. Church attendance is, has been plummeting for years. And today, you know, many of us are Muslims or atheists or heathens or new ageists and, and so on. You know? I wonder how it feels to be to uh, our Muslim uh, compatriots to have this image uh, in your passport, an image that iconizes uh, the violent political endeavor to make the Danes Christians. But uh, this Christian domination is only the, um, the most direct and superficial layer of meanings in this, in this image. There are other layers, uh, layers that are more ambiguous and that seem to almost uh, contradict this message of Christian uniformity and cultural domination. Now, notice how uh, this Christ figure isn't hanging on a cross. He, uh, he seems more to be like floating between branches. And people familiar with Norse law wouldn't take long to think of the god Odin, who uh, sacrificed himself by hanging. Uh, and there's also actually a description of an Odinic sacrifice, uh, where the person being sacrificed is being flung into the tree by a, a, a sweeping branch. It's a, from a, a saga somewhere. And scholars have noted uh, that this image here, it almost appears as a rendering of the old English visionary poem, The Dream of Rude, where, where the world tree is mounded by a hero, which, and then it's transformed into a crucifixion scene. Now, Odin, as it happens, was in fact the, uh, the patron deity of Harald's royal dynasty, the Skildings, the descendants of Skild, the son of Odin. Now, this dynasty uh, would later choose for themselves a Christian patron saint that was also composed with some notably Odinic motives. It's, I made another video about that. Uh, but this stone here is also located in the middle of what used to be a huge heathen sanctuary, a V with an enormous stone setting, which today is, is marked by some fairly neutral modern art installation. And these great mounds here that we used to sit on them when we were in high school and have a morning beer uh, uh, when we've been drinking through the night in the nearby, uh, nearby town. These, these, uh, these mounds, they were set over Harold's parents, King 
Gorm and uh, the old and, and Queen uh, Chira. Uh, so in this very heathen setting somehow, a representative of the Skilding dynasty, the descendants of Odin, puts up an image of Christ that really resembles Odin. Coincidence? I don't think so. Intelligent power game? Probably. Odin is also the god of masking, as I was noting in another video. Um, one of his names is Grimur or Grimnir, the masker or the masked one. Uh, and is this a masking? In, in my uh, study of afro brazilian religion, this kind of masking is an important model for how to resist cultural oppression. Uh, and I'm not saying that Harold thought like afro brazilians that, like, that he would hide Odin inside an image of, of Christ. What he did, and this is comp competent, Odinic, you might say, power language, worthy, you might say, of a skilling king in the process of forming a state, what he did do was deliberately sending ambiguous signals. Signals that allowed him to harness the power from European Christian allies, protect his realm from the kind of Christian onslaught that had been brought on the Saxons. Uh, the ambiguity of these signals allowed exactly the kind of masked reading among his followers that I've seen in, in afro brazilian religion. They came here to this heathen sanctuary, stronghold of Odin's royal dynasty, and they found an image of the new god so easily associated with the old. An image is, in a sense, what people see. So is this, in a sense, Odin? I think so, in a sense. In a sense. And in a sense, it's very comparable to the way an image of Santa Barbara to Afro-Brazilians is the storm goddess uh, Yangsa. Uh, the people who uh, put in such as these kind of statues in churches, they might see one figure they might see the ambiguity that Santa Barbara is also young to Afro-Brazilians and that this image is perhaps owed into the peasants that come from out there. Uh, they might ignore this ambiguity more or less willfully and they might play with it. it. That's difficult to say, but the ambiguity is there and it opens the image to different interpretations, different presences, you might say. This is in itself a masking logic. And so you could say that, that, that like with with Santa Claus and Odin, you know, the, 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 this kind of identification, it's, it's, it speaks to Odin's trickster side, the Grimnir, the masker. It, it almost lives in this kind of ambiguous uh, representation. So when we look at our passports, perhaps it's not only this making Christians, uh, making us Christians that we see, the, this cultural uniformity that power demands, uh, the power which is still today struggling to Christianize the Danes, to uniform what we're supposed to be. Uh, there's also uh, another image in this, uh, in this uh, another message in this image, uh, and, and, and a message of some sort of resistance. It's not a, it's not a barricade resistance, it's, it's, it's a resistance of, of, of interpretation. There are, there are, there, there are a tone of, of subaltern voices uh, in there, that the, the mask bearer, the god with uh, hundreds of names, the plurality that we really are. Um, so in a sense, this is perhaps also an image for the Muslim Danes, the New Ageists, the Atheists and so on. All the others, all those others that we really are and that cannot just be silenced. Uh, with this uh, demand for uniformity that would uh, be so useful for a medieval king and which is still somehow practiced in different ways of course but still practiced I would say by uh, Danish politicians who want to Christianize the inhabitants uh, of this land by controlling media and policy making and so on. Yes, thanks for listening to this little rant against Harold, my own old enemy and um, um, you can follow this channel and you can also uh, uh, Patreon support me if you like uh, what I do. Thank you very much and see you around.